Okay, Simone, over to you. Hello, um, I'm Simone Shears, and I'm the team manager for the IFT Independent Futures team with Hampshire County Council. That is basically the transition team. And we transition young adults, like earliest, earliest, earliest is 14, um, into adulthood and um, provide basically a, we assess their eligibility for adulthood. And if they are eligible, then we see how we can support individuals into adulthood. Oh, you're on quiet, Sarah. I'm on mute now. <laughs> and what, what more can you tell us about the service today, Simone? Can you give us some um, case studies or? Um, well, basically, what we work really closely together with uh, children's services in um, in Hampshire County Council, and most of the children or young adults we assess come from the disabled children's team. So, if a young person is already already under the young children's team, um, like the DCT, then often they are automatically referred to our team because they're in receipt of a care package, and there is a very high likelihood that they are eligible in adulthood. But we also have in um, young individuals who haven't been under children's services and can be referred to our team. The current process is that if professionals refer, and that could be like a teacher from, from a special school, or um, it could be a health professional, they can refer directly to our team. If a parent wants to refer, they have to go via our card service. That's basically the front door. So a professional will do a well-being check and complete the referral form with the parent and send it off to us. And that's just kind of to screen it that it's an appropriate referral, that the age is correct. Because we had we would have otherwise a lot of referrals who are over 18. And um, for us, it's important that we start with a with the transition really early. That doesn't mean necessarily 14, but it means that by 17 and a half that the young person has a support plan in place and um, the young person and the parents know what is going to happen when they turn 18. Because if they receive a service from children's services, that service will stop with the day of the 18th birthday. And if they're eligible, and under our team, they will have a service then implemented from the day of their 18th birthday. And what we try is that we work really closely with parents, the individual parents uh, and professionals together. So that is kind of like a flowing process rather like a cliff edge, because we know that parents and individuals are very concerned about transition and turning 18 and there's lots of worries about mental capacity and you know does my child now makes all their decisions themselves so we support really with all these matters and help to try support people to kind of have individuals at home with some support some individuals will move out and it's for each person completely different it's a completely different um, pathway. So um, if people have concerns, they can ask us some specific question, they can contact me just to see, you know, when would be the best time to start. Because sometimes we say early and then we start, you know, around the age of 16 and nine months and people think, but that's not early. But if we start too early, like then, you know, kind of we can't make or can't allocate any specific services because no provider would know, like by the time they turn 18, that they actually have got capacity. And it's only for those with most significant need where we start really early. And, you know, a lot of individuals often in care, they live outside Hampshire. So we need to plan to return them. So that's probably more for that cohort. But we, we're really happy to discuss, you know, if parents have concerns about, you know, how is it all going to work when there's no more school and I need to work. I think that's often areas where parents are worried because five days schools and then that stops or it's college where there's less days that causes problems with families. But we have helped greatly with that and there is support available. So what sort of services are you able to allocate, Simone? So we're looking obviously at the individual need and someone needs to be eligible. But if someone no longer goes to a day uh, to a school, there's obviously if if someone has got the capacity and ability, we're looking at internships. We're looking at paid employment. 
and we're also looking at college if that's something where someone you know can follow on from school and we can look quite flexible what could be done on the you know if it's for three days and two days need to be covered because mum or dad are working on these days then we can look at like a direct payment at a PA who supports the individual at very very varied whatever suits the family best and it also depends on the area where the individual leave because some areas are easier to find support or groups uh, than, than others that always has been um, quite um, tricky at times for some areas but we're quite flexible and we're becoming more creative in how we can support parents and I think I think we say, don't we, that we should start to talk about transition from our year nine annual review. Mm -hmm. So is this something that you think should be discussed? You know, do you think the independent futures team is, is a, a team that should be mentioned at annual review and perhaps should even you know, be getting into being on the EHCP? Is that something that would be? Yeah, I think, you know, kind of when if if there are concerns from the individual and, you know, they feel that we need to um, be involved, then we can be involved from year nine. We're not necessarily always involved, or with some individuals, we just attend, for instance, the EHCP meeting with our duty social worker and, you know, not getting any more involved only if it's needed, because that would need too much capacity. But generally, with some individuals, we get right in really early because there is just so much to support with or the anxieties are really high and it needs a longer period while with others where they have already support in place often we continue with that support we we're not necessarily changing everything for individuals just they turn 18 a lot of providers they provide support post 18 so sometimes we're able to keep the same and particular during you know kind of this time it's really difficult with identifying carers and care agencies so if something works we wouldn't necessarily kind of say no we're not having that we're changing it just for the sake of it <laughs> we, we're trying also with direct payments that's always something what we consider quite early so if someone has a relative or someone they know would be really happy to provide some support then we can provide that quite flexible for the individual and that often gives greater consistency because it's the same person but also kind of um uh, kind of flexibility because you know kind of if it's not the Tuesday they can probably easier arrange if they need someone flexible than with a care agency so if that's possible that's always a great help yeah and you said that parents can self-refer but they almost need to be triaged so so where yes. do parents need to go to find out how they would self-refer our front page um, has CART and, you know, kind of all individuals who want a service or want to kind of who are not allocated and need some support go via our um, CART service. I can write in the chat the yeah, telephone in a, in a number. Minute, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, I do that. And they um, speak basically to an advisor um, and say to them and they will make a decision. If someone, for instance, sometimes we have referrals and the individual is already 17 years and 10 months that would leave us only two months by the time the individual would be allocated they would be probably already 18 and um, in those cases we kind of say they need to go directly to the adults team because that that is not a meaningful transition especially if there needs to be services sourced because all it takes a little bit of time um so it's it's ideally if people come we can 17 is a good age 16 and a half to refer that gives us a bit more time around that time and if they have a social worker and children's then you know discuss it with them because that's probably the the professional we work closest with and we can attend all the meetings if they have sin plan or you know all these things so that's that's the best i write the card number in the in the chat but there will, I mean, there will be children, won't there? Who and you, you mentioned that they could come through the disabled children's team. But certainly, I know a lot of young people who don't have a social worker and aren't part of the yeah. disabled children's team. And that's where is it that the parents would se would self refer? They can self refer, but if they're at a school, then the school can okay. refer. Like, if okay. they have a school like um, who do I think of? Like Henry Tindall or Rachel Maddox, they know very well how to refer to us because we work a lot with them. So it's they, they just need to fill out our referral form and send it to our duty inbox 
it doesn't take long and um yeah so that that's quite straightforward and then we get in contact i know that um and you mentioned this to to specialist schools would, would you assume if a child is in a mainstream setting that they wouldn't be eligible for your service well sometimes they are eligible but there's obviously if you know the expectation would be if they cope within an environment in in a kind of mainstream school they may not but it's still worth referring to us okay. because it's it's very individual and sometimes people compare themselves with others we, we can't do that because you know there may be needs you know someone is not quite aware of and we have such a variety of individuals um so it's definitely worth referring to us and make sure you do it in sufficient time that plans can be put in place before yes. 18. yeah okay and then just for my mind when that when that plan is then put in place and that's 18 until well, what we usually do, um, the longest is like we, we, we have like a description of our service and that says officially 25. We don't, I don't think we have anyone with 25. The oldest people we probably have are people or young people at residential schools because we keep them until they finish residential school and then support them when they're often return back to Hampshire or, you know, need a different service. But usually what we do is we support someone, have the care package hopefully in place like three, four, five months before they turn 18. And then they use the service when they turn 18. And then we wait, let's say one, two, three months, have a look, everything works fine and hand over to the adult team. That doesn't mean they're necessarily allocated there, but it means they are kind of eligible and um, can get support if they need it in the future. So they, your team's role is actually almost managing that transition period. Yes, yes. So we're not like sometimes it's it's kind of because we we work probably quite a long time with individuals and you know I do understand parents who who say oh it's you know it would be good if you could longer but obviously we got the next cohort through coming as well that's why we're kind of um, encouraged. Quite a change around, isn't it? It's, it's it's it is very so we need to kind of work really like time focused because for us every month someone turns older. <laughs> And that takes time away. So we need to kind of work really efficiently. Mm. So if you had one message that you'd like parents, carers to take away from today, what would it be? Um, I think there's a lot of anxiety and I completely understand. But, you know, we, we have worked through COVID and I think we have reassured a lot of parents, especially if you need to work. You know, I'm a working mum, so we are quite flexible and um, very creative so if you have concerns contact us and you know we can look at your individual case and how we can support best super thank you and if when you get in a second if you get a moment pop that link in, yeah. in the page because well, it's always it's always good to share because it's one of the things I'm constantly bagging on about as parents we're yeah. constantly told just to google it and it's we'll do. google so easy when you know what to google when you don't it's not quite so straightforward right now I'm looking at all my little pictures, little pictures, and I know that Tony Marie is, ah, there you are, Tony. I've spotted you now with the blue background. Super. Yes. I realize so, the recording you... probably didn't want my mess of a room in the background. So I <laughs> did you have some slides you wanted to pop up? I did have some slides. Well, there, it's quite a large pack, but what I'll do is aim to run through it reasonably quickly, and then I'm happy to share um, with people after. Um, send it out by yourself after the event. Just going to see if I can do this without losing everyone. Ooh. Right, so I'm um, just going to talk about post-16 options in education. Uh, so there are many options across all of our educations within college. And as you, anyone that's coming towards this, you'll realise there are options in college with our education providers and lots of different things to consider. So I wanted to start just talking about our All Our Talents Plan, which is our Hampshire Send Employability Action Plan. So this is around our commitment in Hampshire um, to work to support send young people in moving towards independent futures and employment in their adult lives. So what we're looking at is developing a county-wide joined up and high performing employability offer for SEND young people, which focuses on maximizing progression into sustained employment um, for those 
for those that have a realistic aspiration of being in employment as they get older. So all of this is based on the principles of preparing for adulthood. I'm not going to go into this too much because I'm sure you've all heard, heard these principles and heard about this um, before. So I won't, I won't linger too far and too much on that for you. Uh, I've lost. So getting into what's out there. So there are a whole range of colleges across Hampshire and you'll probably know your local ones that offer a range of courses and educational opportunities for a range of different uh, kind of educational and academic ability young people. So many of our colleges have really positive entry level foundation courses and everything right up to kind of level ones and vocational level twos, level threes and pathways into higher education. But there are some other options out there as well for our post 16 young people. So we have traineeships plus, which is around improving chances to get a job or apprenticeships and helping prepare for the world of work. So there's a link there for that. And that's an internal Hampshire program through Hampshire Achieves. We've also got Skills to Achieve, which is delivered by our Enham Trust in Basingstoke, Southampton, Portsmouth and Eastleigh. And again, this is kind of providing those skills and support to move forward into independence and adult life. And we've got a preparation for independence and employment program. So this is kind of a level entry one to level one that looks at independent living, travel skills, uh, confidence team building. And the idea of this is that it's a kind of preparation course for those young people that might want to consider traineeships or supported internships. So supported internships are a study programme aimed at young people 16 to 24 who have an EHCP. So this just gives you an idea of what it's like. It's about providing that support alongside skills development with work, real workplace learning to support young people. So it's around jobs coaches supporting young people to find work placements and support them in that role to learn on the job. So it has great benefits for young people. They gain new skills and learning, support them in having successful careers. It's clear pathways into paid employment. It's a really key element of supported internships and into supported apprenticeships, provides financial and social independence. We see improved health and community engagement with young people that are in employment in later life and improved confidence, well-being, and self-esteem. So there's a load of options in order to access a supported internship in Hampshire, if that's something you're interested in. We have Hampshire Achieves, which is our Hampshire County Council supported internship program. There's Project Choice, which is an NHS Foundation Trust program that runs out of <coughs> several of our NHS hospitals across Hampshire. So uh, they're definitely in Winchester and they've just opened in QA. And for the life of me, I know there's two other hospitals and I cannot remember what they are now, but I can find that out and send that across to you. We also have several supported internships that run out of colleges across Hampshire. So this is a selection of the colleges that we know are running those or were part of the pilot programme. Um, but your local FE will know generally what supported internships are available in your local area. And if you want to know, um, you can contact us and we can point you in the right direction. So the Send Employability Hubs also offer a supported internship or pathways to supported internships um, for those that want to access employment. So the Send Employability Hubs are a new programme we're working with our colleges on in order to provide a post-16 option that brings together employment principles and education progression for our Send young people. So it's about our colleges being able to provide them with the education progression that they want, it'd be that in entry foundation or in level one to level two, but also provide them with the opportunities to learn skills and look at matching into employment placements so that when they come out with their educational achievements, they're best able to access employment moving forward. So they provide a flexible approach that meets individual needs and they combine um, induction and in-college work with workplace experiences. Um, so opportunities to engage in work experience, talk to employers alongside their educational delivery. Um, and it's also pathways into paid employment through supported apprenticeships and supported internships. 
the eligibility is any young person with an EHCP who is ambitious and passionate about accessing employment and gaining independence. Um, and we start that program from year, for year 12 students. So there's some of our intended outcomes. We're also doing a piece of work alongside this with our employment market in Hampshire to make sure they're best prepared to provide ongoing support and career pathways for our young people as they move into adulthood and gain employment. These are our current hubs that are up and running in colleges. We are looking to extend this further as we develop and move forward. <coughs> so I, I'm happy to send those contact details over. And the idea is that we've spread those across the north and south and really as far spread as we can get in Hampshire because we're aware it's a large geography. So I wanted to briefly talk about some brand new provisions that we've got coming up as well called the Send Independence Hubs. So this is a programme to look at supporting our highest needs young people in their post-16 journey. So this is primarily looking at those young people that might be um, struggling with severe learning difficulties or complex needs, who would historically have remained in kind of a special school or specialist provision. And what we're trying to do is create spaces and curriculum offers within our general further education provision so that they can come and join a community within a college and have the support they need in order to achieve um, while having that safe transition into a wider area within a college, but still maintaining some of that positive education curriculum development and those safe spaces that they, that they will still require moving forward with their education. So the bespoke curriculum, um, we are currently adapting physical spaces. HSDC have got a new provision on Alton campus, which is opening um, next week. No, not quite next week, the 1st of December. They've got their first students undertaking some transition activities. So these units will very much be about working with young people before they move out of their current provision providing opportunities to engage and make sure it's the right provision for them moving forward at year 12. Um, they're carefully designed programs to support that transition and support those learners. Our first independence hubs are being opened for our year 12 learners in September, 2022. So they will be at HSDC Alton and Farnborough College of Technology. And there'll be classes of eight learners per year um, to make sure that we can really support those learners in a, a really good environment for them. Um, I'm really excited about these and I, don't, I could talk about these units, the, the, these um, independence hubs, but they're really about supporting young people to have those opportunities in their own communities um, to engage in education and move forward and hopefully create those links in education that might support them with any future eligibility and adult service support they require and into their independent lives and that might look like an employment future for them it might look like just support into independent living and allowing them to live independently in a way that's right for them so that won't always look like living in your own house for some of our young people but it might look like having access to a community group that you can go and visit and you know your local area and the people know you um, so we're also looking at following this up with additional sites. So at the moment, we're looking at September 2023 openings in Brockenhurst College and Andover College. And we are still approaching and talking to other general at education sites who might want to get involved. In how, how does the young person access that service, Tamer? Is that is that via it being identified as part of the HCP process? Yeah, so the idea would be um, during the HCP, process the SEND team the parents and the college would have a discussion about this being the appropriate pathway for a young person so it might it won't be right for everyone but we're hoping that it'll be right for a really good option for some young people so it is about discussions at your EHCP reviews um, we're hoping those discussions obviously for the new provisions next year they should be starting in your year 11 annual review um, now and if if it doesn't get brought up, please do bring it up. And if it's appropriate, you'll send a worker and we'll know about that or the school can contact us to find out a bit more. 
Um, and we're hoping moving forward that those discussions can start from kind of year nine as, as we start working on those transitions and we can make this the right pathway for some of our same young people. I will stop sharing now. I understand that I've probably whipped through that really quickly, but I was aware I had a lot of slides and we've got limited time, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, I, yeah, I think it's such a huge area. I mean, uh, it, it's an area I don't know a great deal about and I had slightly have my head in the sand about because I've just done transition to secondary, but it, it, you know, it's one of those things where I think, where it's better to be pre-informed and have these options available and know what's out there so that we can start to consider these things because it, it moves so quickly. Right, I've got various questions that have come through. They're not necessarily for your bit, Tony Marie, so we'll, so we'll see who's best place to answer them. And if anybody else who hasn't spoken is the right place to jump in and answer them, please do. So I am just going to, I've got a, a, a comment from um, Jane who's here, um, who's, the head of the SEND team, which says discussions should really be from year 10, but definitely, year, sorry, from year nine, but definitely year 10 review, so we can have provision named by the 31st of March in the year due to moving, move, move to a new setting. Absolutely. It's really important that we, we talk about this early, and year nine seems so early, they seem so little, but it's really important. Right, let me just have a look and, at these questions. Um, so I think the first question is probably for Simone. Can support be provided for working part-time too? I know Simone talked about support for working parents. Is that whatever their work situation is, Simone? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if someone ha has eligible needs, then we can support, you know, if a mum for respite for parents, it's not just for working parents. The support is there for the individual. So, yeah. Okay, super. Thank you. Um, and I've got who currently provides support to the young people in Rushmore specifically? Is, it a, is there a specific provider? I wouldn't know kind of. Oh, Sam is there. We have a provider service in uh, in, in adults in different areas. That's Sam Davenport, my manager. So I'm, I'm not quite aware who's the new provider in Rushmore. Do you know, Sam? You're um, unmuted. Yeah, hopefully you can hear me. My screen we can. keeps constantly so I, I can't see anyone moving but um hi everyone so I'm um, one of the service managers in in adult services Hampshire County Council and I I work with Simone so I oversee the independent futures team and um, Simone's right so in, in adult services we have um sort of a contracted provider per geographical area now that doesn't mean that that is the provider that young people have to have that is our kind of default provider if someone needs a care agency but um, we can still explore direct payments or as Simone said if there is an agency working with the young person already we can consider whether we can commission with them uh, you know as they turn 18. Um, we're just going through a retendering process it's one of the challenges we have in the local authority because due to the size of our contracts we have to legally um, what we call retender them every so many years and uh, literally at the start of December there will be new providers um, so I can let you know who the provider for Rushmore will be. But as I said, we, we're not completely um, strict on having to use them. It's just that we have a kind of a default provider um, that we would go to initially. Super, thank you. Um, just going back to that part time question, parents just clarify for me that they what, and, and I sort of got the wrong end of the stick. What they wanted to know is if you could support a young person who they themselves, the young person, had part time employment. Yeah. Yeah, we work very closely together with uh, Tony Marie. So we had someone successfully like having an internship in a hospital. So we also kind of look at employment, paid employment. We look at all varieties and there's obviously a lot of individuals who are not able to do that. So we support them as well to have meaningful day activities, what's best suited to their interests and needs. Super, yeah. thank you. Um, a question around where, because where I'm in Hart and Rushmore, and obviously it's an interesting area because we're surrounded by multiple counties, and quite often a young person lives in one county but goes to school in another county. So I've got a question saying, would they be able to join in if they have an EHCP based in Surrey? I think that's actually a Hampshire child in a Surrey school. Does that make any difference to the service provision? Um, for us, it's some, correct me if I'm wrong, and Jane, for us, it's the address where the parents live. Okay. Yeah. So that would be. Yeah, and, and we certainly do have young people where we commission at what we would call out of county resources for. So if there was a, 
a, a day service or a group in Surrey that wouldn't prevent the young person from continuing to access it. Yeah. So that, that's the same as EHCPs, I, I guess, isn't it? Yeah. So if your EHCP is, a, is it actually a hamster EHCP, then, then you're eligible. Yeah. All we would, would we'd want to make sure is that it, because some of those services aren't as well known to us because they're not in Hampshire, sometimes we do check with um, Surrey local authorities to make sure they've got no concerns about the services because I say we're, we're not so familiar with all of them. Super. Now, this one might be switching into your area, Tony. Um, for young people to receive employment support, do the words employment or work need to be written into EHCP plans? So I'll start off, but Jane might want to add in as well. So from year nine, we would expect to see preparing for adulthood to be addressed in EHCP annual reviews. And one of the key principles of preparing for adulthood is employment. But what we would like to see within that is an acknowledgement of their aspirations for employment. Um, not having employment stamped or, or put into an EHCP doesn't prevent a young person accessing the Send Employability Hub, if they have an aspiration for employment, uh, ideally that would be reflected in their EHCP so that we were reaching outcomes that have been managed in that. But if that is their aspiration and they're interested, they can still go into those courses within the colleges that we've got hubs in and they would work with them at the beginning of their time with the college in year 12 to unpick those aspirations and career pathways for them. Did you have anything to add to that, Jane? I was just going to say, so so if we go into supported internships or supported employment, then obviously we wouldn't be necessarily putting employment in there. You'd be putting the training provider that's providing that training into Section I. So Tony Marie's absolutely right. We need to start looking at the outcomes, looking for the aspirations of the young person. So from the age of 16, we really need to start looking at what they would like to do with their life what their future ambition is, where they would like to live, where they would like to work, um, you know, what their community might look like so we can help them as much as possible to get where they need to go. It's a really tricky one, isn't it? Because, um, you know, my elder daughter is, well, she's year eight at the moment. She says she's sort of talking about, oh, maybe one day I'd like to do this. But it's a really big ask, isn't it? So, so um, we need to support. And, 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 and is, there a, 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 is there support for supporting our young people to have those discussions? because it's, it, they're really big questions, aren't they? Yeah, so, so Sendias um, used to obviously provide advocacy services for young people, and it's really important that we try and get an advocate to be able to get their views moving forward. And, and, and obviously there's sometimes conflict, you know, let, let's, not, let's not underestimate this, you know, the same as with any household, whether a child's got special needs or not, you know, we as parents like to say that we know best, but... <laughs> You know that there is conflict sometimes by between what a young person would like to say they want to do and what a parent would like them to do but the code of practice is really clear that we have to try and get the views of the young people and trying to get their us to be able to deliver their aspirations for the future i was just going to add that there should be opportunities for every young person including our same young people to access careers advice while they're at school um, so if they're not having access to a careers interview or someone to talk to about their future aspirations, um, then do contact your schools and ask for that to take place. Um, but yes, it's very much around kind of that aspiration and expectation. And what we do within our hubs is look at an ABC of employment. So it's your any job, your better job and then your career. So it's managing that expectation that we all step out of education into our career pathways, which I don't know about anyone else, but I certainly didn't myself. So how we create those opportunities to gain the skills that will later lead you to that better job in the, your career as well. I, I really like that. I've not heard that before. I think that's, I think that's really good. Um, Another one about sort of the services you've talked about, Tony Marie, is what is the eligibility for, for, for those services? I think you talked about, you know, the, that last bit you talked about, there was only eight places in the college. So that's, I mean, they're obviously, you've got two colleges, they're going to be in demand. So what's the eligibility for those places? So there's diff slightly different eligibility for each of the things I've spoken about. Um, the supported internships and the SEND employability hubs are an, having an education healthcare plan 
um, and you can access those. If they're the right pathways for you, um, that's fine. The Independence Hub is slightly different because there's limited spaces and it's about creating the provision for our highest needs learners. Um, it's around those that have got severe learning difficulties and complex needs to the extent that they wouldn't historically have been able to engage with a general FE college. Our employability hubs kind of aim to hit that group below that, who would have classically gone to maybe a general FE, but being able to provide that additional support. So for kind of maybe our moderate learning difficulties or spectrum disorder young people, and I really hate putting those designations on because it's it's not as clear as that. It's about what's the right pathway for the right young person. Um, and supported internships, it's access to an education or having an education healthcare plan in place, as it is with our traineeship classes and a supported apprenticeship. But those three can be very different, uh, slightly different in regards to where you are academically and what the education provider can provide within their setting. So supported internships are everything from entry one to level two. Um, traineeships is very much uh, provider dependent because they run out of several different places, um, but they're pretty much from kind of entry one, uh, entry two to level two. And supported apprenticeships, it depends on the level of apprenticeship that you're accessing from your provider. So there are level one to level four apprenticeships available. So it really depends on what your provider can offer within that. I hope that was clear around eligibility. I, I think I think it's one of these things, isn't it? I think it's quite complex. And I think everybody's situation is so unique that mm. you have to pull the bits out of the work for you. So I've just got a little bit of extra information here from Philip that he sent to me to say that schools and colleges are under a duty to provide carers guidance from year eight. For young people with SEN, this is added to by local authority support via annual reviews, et cetera, as Jane has said, um, and, and the local offer. Um, and he's also added that the Independence Hub will eventually have 40 places each. So that's, you know, that's that's fantastic. That's a, that's a huge number. Um, we're currently planning for four hubs, but we are looking at two to four further hubs by 2025 funding allowing. Yeah, <laughs> always the case, isn't it? Now, again, the question I think for you, Tony Marie, what are the options for young people who will never be able to access work pathways? So for those young people that would not, I mean, I would argue that most young people can access some sort of work pathway, but obviously there might be a very small minority. With the right support, I think most young people will be capable of accessing some employment pathway. That might not happen in the kind of standard three years by 19, but it might be possible with more years with the support. But for those that will not be in a position to be able to access employment pathways, that's where we link in very much with Simone and her team about the right transitions for that young person into their adult eligibility. Is that so that's one, that's one end of the spectrum, isn't it? What about the other end of the spectrum where we have young people who have additional needs, but perhaps don't have um, any HCP? Is, 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 do you support them as well? So we don't support them currently within the hubs. But there are support mechanisms and careers advice support through most of our colleges with their, their standard foundation delivery and career support. There's also new youth employment hubs that are springing up across the county. And they're very much around supporting all young people um, to access employment from 16 to 25. But they've also got a send support element within their, their youth employment um, hubs within them. So they are in a position to be able to support where that there's a sense support need, but it doesn't quite reach that EHC or that it might reach the same sort of levels, but there's no EHCP in place. And it's the aspiration that at the end of their time with you, they will be able to continue in the workplace unsupported or in a where a model of support has been set up independent of your service. So there's, there's several options regarding that. So our hope is for those young people, we can support in a supported internship and then progress that into a paid employment opportunity and then almost hand that support role over to the employer that they're with. So our, the, the ambition would be that our employers are best placed as you would line manage any person that was working with you to support those young people. 
that would be the, the ideal, but there are opportunities and options for businesses themselves to draw down funding from the DWP through access to work in order to provide additional support for young people in, the, in their businesses. So that might be through adaptions to the physical workspace. It might be through the business commissioning externally a job coach to do that support and employment in a longer period. So there are options. There's also options if they, as, a, as young people move into adulthood, we have support and employment options in our adult services as well. So if they, they do that and then so, for some reason drop out of paid employment and need that little bit of extra help back into paid employment as adults, we have processes in place into adult services as well. I hope that it's, it's such a complex area, isn't it? Because if we're talking about young people who, who need support, Support and who might never live independently and yet are going into paid employment and the complexity of it is 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 vast um so it's really good to know there are some services out there to support um yeah there's services to support and there's also opportunities for us to be really working strongly with our employers so we all in our workplace have our individual needs and it's about how we support employers to recognize that send young people bring a huge amount of talent and skill into the workplace and just by providing this little bit of extra support within their environment that is part of your role as an employer, you can have huge strides and great career ambitions for our young people. Absolutely. Right, hang on, I've seen something pop in at the bottom. So I'm, ah, right, I'm just going to pop back up to this one. Um, we've talked a bit, we've talked well, quite a lot about starting this early, starting it um, from year nine. Um, but I've got a comment from a parent um, which I suspect Jane would be best placed to answer, saying um, that they haven't seen um, somebody from SEN in an EHCP for four years. Um, so how do they get involved? Is, are there particular transition points, Jane, where you think that perhaps, you know, that those EHCPs um, school should be making sure that somebody from the team attend? Yeah, so normally it's the transition annual review. So, so we try where where possible to, and it, and it hasn't been easy over the last few years because, you know, the growth has come in and we've been trying to expand the service and obviously COVID's hit. So there are a number of reasons, but we normally try and attend the year five or some of the year five transition annual reviews. If there's likely to be um, a change of type of placement or a request of a different type of placement, and sometimes where it it, it could be um, requesting perhaps an out of county placement rather than one of our schools. Um, year 10 annual reviews will be a focus moving forward as we start to develop the preparation for adulthood side of the service. It's not um, been as, um, it's not been as strong as we would like it to be. And I think that was highlighted in the local area ascend inspection. That's somewhere where we've got to develop and we are looking to work much more closely with Tony Marie and her team and Simone's team moving forward. And I've got a, a new PFA lead starting in the service just before Christmas. So hopefully we will then start to see that starting to move on. But yes, if you think it's necessary, yes, if you think there's going to be anything that they can contribute to it. But obviously, just make sure that the annual review paperwork is really, really clear. The preferences are really clear. Um, and that we can then act on those um, as, as soon as possible to secure those placements as soon as possible. Excellent, thank you. I think I think one of the things um, that we I hear when we uh, where it gets together is, is that sometimes settings don't actually know what's out there for our young people because they're, they're not necessarily, particularly mainstream settings, aren't specialists in our young people and the options that are out there. And it's sort of knowing where to go for those. Philip, are you about? Do you want to very quickly unmute and just have a because you're telling me lots of wonderful things and talk me through them. Hi, Sarah. Hello. Um, I, I just thought I'd add some comment to the discussion, really, rather than sort of um, pulling up the airwaves, as it were. But, um, you, you know, first of all, let me caveat all of this by saying, you know, I wouldn't want, wish to be uh, a mistake as being complacent. We've got more work to do, and everything we're hearing today is you know, an effort towards um, supporting more young people to have strong outcomes and live and fulfilling lives but it's not a deficit model that, that that's really i think what i want to put across Hampshire has more further education places uh, than any other local authority in the country it's about thirty-five thousand funded places every year it's a quarter of a billion pound system uh, amongst our, our 14 colleges or if you include the cities in the island 
uh, more again if you include Surrey, etc. And about 90% of uh, all young people, irrespective of their, their sort of status, participate in full-time education post 16. So, you know, for the majority of young people, caveat on this, because I don't know every one of the 28,000 teenagers in Hampshire, um, the system works well, and the outcomes they achieve, again, are at a local authority level uh, above national average. So we have a strong, high-performing system. But we know it doesn't work for absolutely everyone, and that's where our effort is focused. Um, and the other point I just wanted to put across is that, you know, ultimately the, the corollary of all of that is we have about one and a half percent of all 16 to 18 year olds are neat. Um, so it's, it's a very small proportion, but of course, every young person who is neat that is, is vulnerable by definition and therefore. You know, Philip, sorry, I don't know the acronym NEAT, sorry. Not in education, employment, or training. Thank so you. they leave school and they're not doing anything. Uh, and it's now a legal obligation for them to do something. But it's our legal obligation to support them. So the point I'm just making there is that, you know, we are working with a small proportion of young people who are not in employment. But it is our duty to support them. And we would want to be responsive to that group, including whether, uh, you know, they have an SEM need or not. So I'm just going to turn my mic off a second and let my dog out so she doesn't disrupt the entire session. Hang on. First time it's happened in 18 months. I don't think that's too bad, Gary. Right. Thank you so much for the professionals we've got here today and everybody else is there anything that any of our professionals want to add I, i'm not going to say that we've missed because there is so much this is such a huge topic um that i appreciate we could go on and on and on and on and on and um, we recorded it so we've got tony marie's slides because there's a huge amount of detail there that that you know we can people can go back and revisit um so that will go up on our youtube channels for people to be able to watch and i know when we do put these up on our youtube channel they get you know they do get a huge amount of viewing because obviously not all of our parents and carers can watch at this time of day so these are you know they're always very very popular at other times so Mona spot you've unmuted did you have something to add I just wonder I struggled to put the message on was the telephone number did it come up or did it not come up I don't think I saw it I don't know how to send I tell you it what, I tell you what we'll sort that out Simone and I will find <laughs> it and I will find another way of sharing it yeah thank you um OK, I think the thing for me that the message that's really come out loud and clear from everybody that's spoken today is that we have to be prepared um, to look at to look at this early, you know, start start looking in year nine um, talk to our young people about their aspirations um, and get, you know, get some advocacy if we need it, because it's it's such a huge area and the options are out there. Um, we just need to, to learn about them and, and work out the, the right the right route for, for our young people. Did anybody else have another question that they wanted to pop in? I think we've got lots and lots and lots and lots. The one question I have got here, and I'm, I'm not sure whether anyone here can answer it, is are there similar setups in Surrey? I'm, I'm guessing, and I know who are. I'm guessing, yeah, I can see Emma giggling. I, I, I'm guessing the answer is yes. They do have something called Surrey Choices. There you go, Emma, Surrey Choices. Go find um, Surrey. If you look up Surrey Choices, they have kind of the same sort of supported internships, programmes that run out of Surrey. I don't know a lot of detail about them, um, but they, they do have a set up called Surrey Choices there. And in terms of how we contact the various services today what i'll try and do is when we post this up um because we'll post the video through our social media channels as well and in that post what i'll try and do is i'll get simone's contacts or whatever and we can put those posts in that so that it'll all pop up as well it's i've learned a huge amount today about bits i didn't know about i hope it has been useful to the parents and carers here today it's lovely to see such a busy session thank you so much for all the professionals who've taken the time out to join us today i'm just going to see if i can find you the the date for our session next month, which I, uh, blah, 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 which I can't, but we should put that on the post as well. Okay, 
Super, thank you ever so much for joining us. Um, bearing with dogs, technical difficulties and everything else, it's very much appreciated. I hope it's been useful and I hope we will see you at an HPCN session before too long. Thank you, I'll stop the recording. <laughs>